welcome everybody here for, for the fourth seminar of Immigrating Landscapes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ulla, for inviting me. I love these kind of things and I love talking about identity and uh, I'm a poet and I love asking impossible questions and I'm going to involve you in an impossible question. So I'm sorry if you're really comfortable, but I'm going to ask you all to move in a moment. And I'm going to ask you to wander around because I believe that whether you're poets, artists, whoever you are, I bet you're all cartographers, really, and you're all making maps of your own world, even as we speak. Because the question I'm asking you is, where do you belong? This is my impossible question to you. Some of you might find that really easy to answer. Some of you may spend the next 10 years trying to answer it. I don't know. Um, and there'll be various pieces of paper that might be a clue to where you belong. I'd like you to walk around, read the pieces of paper, and go and stand on one, or near one. If you can't and you need to walk backwards and forwards, that's also fine. And on your journey of discovery, I'd like you to talk to at least three other people, preferably people you don't already know, and be nosy, find out where they belong, or if they don't belong, or, you know. So, I'm going to ask you all to stand up and wander about the room. Thank you ever so much for being so game and, and join, joining in. It'd be great. I, obviously, we can't hear from all, everybody at this instance, but if maybe two or three people just wanted to give uh, a little feedback on how it felt doing that or whether it was impossible, really easy, or how did you get on? Anybody over this side of the room? You're beaming at me. Tell us how you got on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I made it quite abstract and it was very automatic sort of drawing because I just feel for me identity, the first thing is not defined by place but is defined by people and another thing that I feel it's like a, uh, it works like in levels so that this is the kind of, uh, this is the, the very central is the, the well is the most kind of the strongest emotional attachment to people around me and then it goes like to like from my family to my friends to my country and it, it works in sort of a circle. Mm, fantastic. Well oh, thank you very 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 much. Somebody from this side of the room. Uh, uh, so I've just said that so I'm studying in London now. Um, so I feel like I belong here now but um, I'm not sure I'm connected enough to know that I'll stay next year. Um, well, I spent a year in Poznan uh, as an exchange student. That was a really life-changing experience for me. Um, so I think I'm always going to have a connection to the city, but the sort of the time and the place, so I'm not sure I'd ever live there again. Um, but sort of the summary is that I'm quite, re I'm quite enjoying not having a connection or feeling like I belong anywhere at the moment. Right. Sort of quite open to experiencing Oh, that's really interesting where connection can be a constraint and actually, yeah, so you're quite liberated with that one. I'm going to just read you an extract from something which I wrote and Marek published and Paweł Gawroński beautifully translated from English into Polish and it's suitably called At the Border. Rocked by the motion of the train, we'll be sleeping as we cross the border. Będziemy spać, gdy przekroczymy granicę. Polite young guards will shine a torch in our faces, hand over our papers, but they'll keep something back. Some details without us noticing. Jakiś detal, a my nie zauważymy. For no reason, we'll be woken by stops and starts in the middle of a forest. Bez powodu będziemy budzeni przez nagłe postoje i rozkazy wymarszu. As if reality was snow, unreliable, melting. In the distance, we hear the sound of the train rolling away. Our dearest friends and witnesses, 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 our Nadal będziemy się kłócić, że jesteśmy spóźnieni, a ty będziesz czytać zniszczoną nowelkę. 
Kochanie, właśnie doszedłem do naprawdę ciekawego fragmentu. Nothing will be the same once we've crossed that border, though the warm smell of your skin will be the same. We'll still argue about being late. You'll be reading a paperback novel. Honey, I've just got to a really good bit. Będzie, e, brzozy będą rosnąć po obu stronach torów, a wśród nich może przebiegnie jeleń. A gdy się obudzimy, będziemy mieli zacząć, musieli zacząć od nowa. Nie będziemy się trzymać za ręce, jak będziemy wysiadać. Przyjaciele powiedzą, byśmy się śpieszyli z powrotem. Birches will grow on either sides of the track, and if we're lucky, we might catch a glimpse of a deer. But when we wake, we'll have to start again. Stepping off the train, we won't hold hands. Friends on either side will say, hurry back. Nic nie będzie takie samo, gdy przekroczymy granicę. Chociaż może zapach twojej skóry. Będziemy się kłócić, że jesteśmy spóźnieni. Będziesz czytać zniszczoną nowelkę. Kochanie, właśnie doszedłem do naprawdę ciekawego fragmentu. Nothing will be the same once we've crossed the border. Though the warm smell of your skin will be the same. We'll argue about being late and you'll be reading the same paperback novel. Honey, I've just got to a really good bit. Rocked by the chuntering train. We'll be sleeping as we cross the border. The guards will shine torches in our faces, handing us our papers. But they'll keep something back, without us noticing. We'll be woken by stops and starts in the middle of a forest, as though absence was a breath blown into cupped hands on a cold night. In the distance, our witnesses will grow smaller till their points of light. I guess what we have there is a crossing from place to place, from identity to identity, lots of different landscapes. Um, I'm now going to read a, a piece of a, a short story. I wanted to write from many different voices. And the story I'm going to, I've chosen to read is a story which is, puts you in the driving seat. Um, it's a monologue uh, by a woman, a mother, a recently arrived migrant who has been sent by her GP on the last day before Christmas to see a counselor. And this woman has to, in a language which is not her first language, communicate what it is she is there to talk about and why. And the challenge, I guess, was both in forming the story but also in choosing the language in which to convey this woman's voice. Uh, I'm not sure if I've been successful, but let's see if we can try and help her uh, somehow. My name is Zofia, but you can call me Zosha. This is soft name in my language, but if I say something stupid, say Zocha. That is what I'm when people make when make people mad. Zocha is for me the usual. Sorry, I speak fast. No, I know myself. I am sorry. Polish people very like talking. But after accidents and all others, I must speak before it, before I. Yes, I'm sorry. I will be fine for a minute. Thank you for seeing me. GP say you are very, very good. Good to be so quick last day before Christmas too. She say you are busy always, but yes, I need talk very much. You want, I show you. I keep skin under clothes. Not touch cut, but I can't stop. Now hiding is not so easy at work. It's more and more, and in every day is more and more. Yes, okay. I'm 32. Here in England, six years now. No, I am never sick. Not like this. Never cut. Not crazy. But you have my history from doctor? Okay. Um, so, two-year antidepressants and tablet for sleep is enough for now. Yes, mother, four years old boy, Carol. He is born here, but I am from Weber, which is a small village in Pomerania, meaning besides the sea, just like where I live now, New Haven, by cliffs, seven sisters, you know place. I choose move from Poland to the sea again in England. It is for me, is in me, you understand? My father, yes, butcher, um, 
this is when communism, I was born, and in shops is empty, ration cards, but even with this nothing for people to buy, not so long ago. Everything sent to Soviet Union, so in our shops, nothing. Only flour and vinegar, which is why I still not like things here. Your chips and your fish and your boiled egg in it. But my father, from butcher family, he always had meat to sell. No right people, pay right people, like little criminal. No, our family is always safe. No one ever touches. us. I have the jeans, Cindy doll. You know, all things was not in shops. Trainer with Velcro, nice wool sweater, always imported from black markets. My father had dollars, corrupt. But I never good with all this. Other girls in school jealous. I understand then about people. Yes, I always like more reading book, encyclopedia, and going out to nature. I do a lot of time alone. Where I grew up first, little place was very close to beach, but we have cliffs there too. Not white, chalk, but of sand. Many square kilometers. It's like desert in center of Europe. Vidme. No one know here. You not expect this, a white desert by the sea in Europe. But I bring you pictures next time. Yes, this I do like. And trees are everywhere. Oak, birch, alder, and the animal. You English like watching birds. Black swan and black stork. Mute and whooping swan. Teal, mallard, honey buzzard, sparrow hawk. Yes, this I really like. The name. I make this translation for my friends in English college. But I also like the Latin. Anas Penelope. Anas Creca, Mergus Serrator. They sound better, less like people give the name, more like a god. Really wild all around. But then we moved to town, where my father had too much money. Weber, ugly there. I work in father shop with meat and people. We make more dollars then. I meet there my husband, Antic. He drives delivery truck. A really good man, but... We marry later, much later. I don't know why. Everyone in Weber school then make marriage and babies, but not me. I do not want. Maybe not yet. Antek not happy, but he accepts. I think. He is like little boy to look at. Always sit at home, play computer game, or with friends in pub. But good man. Always bring me flowers on Sunday. Or did. Yes, we go like this maybe 10 years, and then I am 27 already. Crazy the speed of time, and it is decade of our anniversary. Then maybe my pain starts, maybe before. This life is no good. Six every morning, get up, take meat from freezer, have delivery, open shop, cut meat, saw bones, throw innards out. Wear same things, think same things. My friends all have baby and watch TV and maybe go a little crazy when nobody know. Drinking, smoking joints. And so I say, Antek, we will have one too, but not here. Not Poland. Not for child. Antek do not mind. Always want to come to Great Britain. He liked the English clothes. Fred Perry, Ben Sherman. And the other things, you know. Arsenal, Sting, Mr. Bean. Arrival. Behind the tall glass, squeezed by the crowd, your grandparents are waiting. Wave, gasps your mother. She can barely speak, pulling the bursting cases, tugging your hand at the same time. The floor is shiny as ice on a lake. You'd like to stop, slide on it but her hand grips yours too hard. Mamo, papo, she calls out. You look up, her eyes, blue fishes in a melting stream. You've never seen her cry. The two strangers who are your grandparents 
look pleased to see you. They help with the cases. Uvaga, be careful, they say. The stairs are moving, rolling, like a white-capped waterfall. By magic, the people on them glide up and down. Uvaga, if you don't get off in time, these stairs chop off your leg, <laughs> says your new grandmother <laughs> as you jump on. Grandfather clock. Have you seen this? Your mother cries. And you know it's not an obituary, though obituaries are what she checks each day, nor an article reprimanding the communist regime. Right there, on the grainy page, it's Basha, Basha Zarek, standing under a banner that says, Campaign for Homosexual Equality. How did the Polish and Soldiers Daily get a photograph like that? She didn't, wouldn't, couldn't have sent it in herself. <laughs> the solemn grandfather clock is beating out the hour. A recent arrival, along with blue crockery and the roses your mother dug up from your grandparents' dismantled house and garden. What, she says, is a Polish girl doing with all those pederasts? I don't know. You say, we're not really in touch. <laughs> <laughs> the clock stops striking. I'm off then. You close the door as quickly, as quietly as you can. An essential topic, considering the subject of the seminar that we should tackle quite early, is the uh, specificity of being a Polish immigrant or emigrant, and how that seems to have a really specific impact on Polish poetry and Polish prose, prose writing in general. I mean this in the sense that I think that Polish writing and its relationship to emigration is very different than other nations and their relationship to immigration, and how that affects the specifics of the work. So before we start to kind of wind our way down to more specific elements of your work and your biographies and your positions, I'd be really interested in your initial feedback on that thought, how you feel your own relationship and in general your analysis of how Polish history and how Polish culture relates to the idea of being an immigrant or immigrant writer. Uh, perhaps Marek, you begin with You know, there's just a huge landscape of things that you could talk about. Uh, because Poland is such a complex landscape, culturally, geographically, uh, in terms of race, in terms of all kinds of narratives, I feel very privileged. I think it's a great, rich mine of things. But there is something about the, the title that I chose around "Damn the Source." You know, say cut ties, see what happens when you when you lose a lot of the ballast. Because I think, unfortunately, being born in that particular part of the the planet, we are born with a great number of interesting stories, but a great amount of trauma. Do you think it's a historical mode though because you have the comparative situation with Finnish writers writing in Finnish rather than Swedish, Baltic writers who are using poetry in their own language to keep the language alive, Irish writers. Is it about a history of uh, geographical oppression? Is, is there something that's passed on to contemporary writers now that comes from that specific historical mode of Polish poetry being a reservoir of national character when the nation is under threat? in physical terms? I think, that's, I think that's certainly true, although I think it's different if, you, if you're growing up there and living there and writing there, I think your perspective is different. It's also the relationship between the UK and Poland, and I, I don't think people always quite understand that in terms of Britain having been a superpower and how that impacted on Poland's position in the scheme of things. It's not a directly colonial relationship, but I would say it's indi indirectly colonial. Iceland, relatively small place, quite far away. We all know it's very expensive. Um, but it's a long time since I felt as much at home as I did in the presence of writers from this faraway place that I had almost no knowledge of. Um, I was humbled by how great their English was. I was incredibly pleased to hear that, that poetry 
over there was something that was absolutely innate to their sense of identity and they, they seem to damn well enjoy it rather than have it imposed upon them. The way poetry sort of imposed upon the Polish as these kind of sages, Miłosz, Herbert, you know, uh, the, 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 the guys, you know, even further back, Mickiewicz, etc. Um, epics, you know, and there was so much fun being had. I think they would say they're a product of their environment, just like I was saying with the historical moment Poland, they're an isolated nation that has no academic tradition, so you just get incredible avant-garde poets next to really traditional scholarly yeah. poets, and they don't know any different. I've translated over a hundred Polish poets in the last three years, and there's absolutely no doubt that there is a weight pressing down upon them of, of history that stops them liberating themselves and, and, and saying what they want to say. You know, a lot of poets write about childhood. Yeah. Loads and loads and loads and loads of poets write about their childhood, and I do that a lot. But because my childhood is non-English, it's then immediately seen as that I'm writing about the Polish experience. But actually, I'm just writing about childhood. Yeah. The ambition with the book was that it, it, it should be able to reach and represent anyone and everyone at any point uh, in, in history or geography. Uh, whether it succeeds or not, uh, you know, it's obviously for, for readers to decide, but it is, I do not write as a migrant writer ever, even when writing about migration. My experience is that there's such monolithic figures in the Polish tradition. I would even say that the figures of the Silver Age in Russia and the giants of Poland hurt the entirety of Europe for contemporary European poetry because people don't read contemporary European poets, which is why I have a job, I suppose. Because they're more interested in reading people who are either reach the, uh, the size of middle age or death. And that's a real waste, because some people who are writing right now are their equal. And if not their equal, an absolute representation of contemporary life in the world. So, mm. yeah, my experience of Polish work is that it's really vibrant and interesting, but really specifically similar. So each country is different, but no, if you go to a place like Iceland, so I might as well use that as an example, as America's brought it up, you will find people who write in strict rhyme forms, at the same reading, opening for musicians next to sound poets. And so yeah, I mean, obviously I, I speak from a really limited knowledge, not understanding Polish or having lived in Poland, but that's my experience. It's a beautiful opportunity. I mean, if, I, if I ever get to go back to Poland and be king, <laughs> the first thing I'll do is I will ban the use of the word go back. You've got to move forward. It's, okay. to, it's, it's an absurd kind of idea, but it's one we must get used to. If we can actually engage with the issues around exile, around multiculturalism in a way which is real, because I think the current language and the current debate fails, fails those children. Our relationship to our childhood is, is quite a complicated one. I think, for, you know, for most of us, and of course, there'll be things that you look back to and you think, oh, you know, that was really sweet. But there'll be other things that have happened to us that were really horrendous. And, you know, so in terms of going back, there's all kinds of things in childhood that you definitely don't want to go back to. Um, so, I, you know, to me, writing about childhood isn't automatically a, a, a big nostalgic thing. In, in the same way that writing about the country that I come from is not automatically or necessarily uh, nostalgic. This is, not, this is not a library of memories. The, the, the things that, that you convey in those poems <laughs> are so rich and in places so absolutely dark. You deal with so many different aspects of, of, of beauty and of, 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 of fun which we, we hear in the stories, but the things maybe you don't, you don't pick out for a public reading because it's not the kind of thing that works in this context. There are stories there that make you cry and cry and cry and cry again and make me wake up in the morning this morning, go back to them again in order to revisit some of that, not because I like crying, but because it's pain that is absolutely essential, then maybe it's not a library, it's, it's a zoo, it's a, it's, it's, it's a universe of memories. It's something not passive, it's not something which contains things that are neutralized by being put in, in between the pages of a family uh, album or, 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 or a memoir. The things in that book are so alive that I, I just can't see them as alive. Memories don't have to be soppy, you know, a lot mm. of us have got some horrible memories, but we might want to hang on to them because they are part of mm. our story, aren't they? How, how did it come? I, I, I'll tell you about his title. <laughs> what's wrong with his title? <laughs> well, the double meaning. Yeah, what's wrong with his title is that he doesn't damn the source because he celebrates the source. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>
thank you to Marek and Mayu, and especially I want to say thank you to, to Ulla, who's yeah, created yeah. this amazing space for us, you know, and doesn't get enough recognition for it, because it's a really beautiful happening. So thank you to, to Ulla and to Marek and Mayu.